Here we're going to be talking about another scene that unfolded in those final hours of the life of Jesus while he was here on earth. In fact, in fact, we're going, to be, we're going to be talking about the particular part of the ministry of Jesus to humanity that took place between his burial and his resurrection. Most people think that, you know, he died, he was buried, and that was about it. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. But some incredible things happened between his burial and his resurrection. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's an incredible part of what I call the Easter story. We're going to start in uh, Matthew chapter 12 with verse number 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 40. You hear me quote this verse a lot when I tell the Jesus story because it is a significant part of the story. Jesus said this, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Jesus' three-day ministry in the heart of the earth. We're going to talk about what he did while he was there. And you hear me talk about part of this almost every week, but we're going to talk about another part of it that we don't talk about very often, and we probably should, because he had an incredible ministry um, during those three days that he spent in the heart of the earth. But before we jump in and begin, let's pray together. Father, I thank you. You're good, you're kind, you're gracious, you're more than enough. You've given us your word, you've preserved it down through the ages. You've told us that it is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And you have told us, Father, that it is the word of truth. And, and, and Father, as we, as we learn and study from your word, we get to know you better. We can understand your heart and, and your mind, your, your way, your will. And Father, I pray that you'll do that today, that as we take your word into our heart and we hide it there, that it will make us more conformed to the image of your Son, that it will renew our minds. And, Father, that we'll be able to think your thoughts and see life from your perspective and then live the way you want us to. Father, if there's anybody in the room today who's never fully understood the Jesus story, I pray that today will be their day, that they will understand it and that they will believe it and that they will leave here today knowing that they have received the incredible gift of eternal life. So, Father, bless us as we study from your word this morning, I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. All right, so let's look at, these, at, at this whole thought of Jesus spending three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's what he said he was going to do. I don't believe Jesus ever said anything and then went, oops, I shouldn't have said that. I think Jesus was very intentional about everything that he said. So if he said he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, then I am just foolish enough to believe that he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth because he always does everything that he says he'll do. So in this lesson, we're going to examine that often overlooked aspect of Jesus' ministry to humanity, ministry that occurred during the hours between his burial and his resurrection. You see, he did not remain in the tomb. He did not stay in the tomb for those three days and three nights. Let me clarify that his mummified corpse lay in the tomb. And if you remember last week when we studied about his burial, we studied about that Jewish burial custom where they wrapped him in strips of linen cloth alternated by layers of spices made of myrrh and aloes. And that was their, their way of burial. So his, his body was mummified. The corpse lay in the tomb from Friday evening until dawn on Sunday. But his spirit and his soul left the tomb and engaged in crucially significant ministry during those hours. Jesus hinted at this in the verses that we read, particularly the last part of Matthew chapter 12, verse number 40, where he said, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. With that in mind, I want you to look with me at something that Luke wrote in Luke chapter 23, we'll read part of verse 50 and then 52 to 54. This is what Luke wrote. He wrote, now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in a rock one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. I want you to get that, because we're going to set the time of Jesus' burial, and we're going to set the time of his resurrection, particularly his burial. It says it was 
Preparation Day. Preparation Day was the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the seventh day of the week, equivalent to our Saturday. The Sabbath began actually on Friday evening at 6 o'clock, and it ended on Saturday evening at 6 o'clock, because when Jews calculated time, they believed that the day actually started the evening before. And that's pretty evident when you read scripture because if you go back in the book of Genesis and God describes those six days in which he was reconstructing the creation that had been destroyed in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2 he and each day that he described that reconstruction how did he begin he would tell you what happened and then he would say and the evening and the morning were the first day and then the evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day, all the way through six days. So the Jews considered their day starting at 6 o'clock in the evening and running until 6 o'clock the next evening. So the preparation day would have ended Friday evening at 6 p.m. And the Sabbath would have begun Friday evening at 6 p.m. We would call it Saturday, but anyway, Friday evening at 6 p.m. until Saturday evening at 6 p.m. was the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, they were commanded in the law of Moses not to do any work. So if they didn't get Jesus' body in the tomb, prepared for burial and in the tomb by 6 p.m. on Friday night, if they did it during the next 24 hours, they would have violated their Sabbath law. And that's why we find here an urgency. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Six o'clock is creeping up on them. It was about three o'clock when Jesus died, three o'clock on Friday evening. They've got from three o'clock until six o'clock to get permission from Pilate to take the body down, get the body off the cross, prepare it for burial hurriedly, and get it in the tomb by six o'clock, or they're going to violate the Sabbath law. And so we need to understand that. Jesus had also, you got to consider this, Jesus had to leave the tomb. He had to leave the tomb and arrive in the heart of the earth before 6 p.m. on Friday. Because he had to be in the heart of the earth Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to fulfill his prediction that he would spend three days in the heart of the earth. You get that? So in the Jewish mind... He had to be in the tomb, leave the tomb, and get to the heart of the earth prior to 6 p.m. on Friday. Because that's what he said. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Joseph and Nicodemus, Nicodemus placed Jesus' body in the tomb shortly before 6 p.m. on Friday. He had to be in there by that time. He evidently didn't stay there long because according to Jewish time calculation, Friday, the preparation day, ended at 6 p.m. So they got him in there just before 6 p.m., and he didn't stay long. He probably left the tomb as soon as the stone was rolled across the entrance. Time was of the essence. Jesus returned to the tomb and rose from death just after 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. And, and we know that that is true because Mark explained it. Mark wrote this in Mark chapter 16, verse number 9. He wrote, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, the first day of the week started, Sunday started, in their mind, Saturday at 6 p.m., and then early as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, then what happened? He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. So you see, Jesus rose from the dead sometime early on Sunday morning. Are you aware that that's why we have church on Sunday? You know, a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that today is the Sabbath. And especially, you know, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, and, you know, a lot of old timers in the little country church that I went to, and somebody would call on one of them to pray, and this old gentleman would stand up and he'd pray, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Have you ever heard that? I've heard that a lot. Well, they missed it by a few hours. 
Because Sunday morning at about 10 o'clock when he was praying that prayer is not the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday. And in the Jewish mind, it actually started Friday evening at 6 and ran till Saturday evening at 6. You see, the Sunday is the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. You say, well, why in the world in the Old Testament were they commanded to have their day of wor worship and rest on the seventh day? And in the New Testament, it's on the first day. Let me tell you why that is. It's incredible if you just look at it in Scripture. The most outstanding thing that God had done all in the Old Testament. The most incredible thing that God did was creation, right? The rebuilding of his, if you understand creation, it was actually the rebuilding of his destroyed universe in Genesis chapter one. Because God worked six days to rebuild and then what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. And when the Jew got ready to say something really big about God all the way through the Old Testament, how did they describe him? He's the creator of the heaven and the earth. That was the big thing about God. He created all of this. Too bad the world has missed that today. We wouldn't have evolution and all the other stuff that we've got. But I got to tell you this. They worshiped on the seventh day in the Old Testament to celebrate the most outstanding thing God had done to that point in human history, which was creation. And then we move over to the New Testament. Time is rolling along. 400 years or so between the Old Testament and the Old New Testament, and then suddenly God did something even more incredible than creation. God left heaven. God came to earth. God lived here in the form of this one that we call Jesus of Nazareth for about 33 and a half years. God worked a few miracles along the way to prove that he really was God, and then God barely voluntarily died on a Roman rack of execution that we call a cross, and God was buried, and then, uh, then he had this ministry that we're talking about, and then God rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven and had purchased eternal life for everybody who would ever believe that story. My friend, that is even more incredible than creation. So from the point of the resurrection of Jesus on, when you find any mention of the church meeting at a particular time from that time on, when did they meet? On the first day of the week. You can find it repeatedly. So why do we meet on the first day of the week today? To celebrate the most important, significant, incredible event that has ever happened in human history up to this point in time, and that's that Jesus rose from the dead. So for a Christian who understands that, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday for us is a celebration of the fact that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. We know that he is living, whatever men may say. We hear his voice of mercy, and, or we see his hand of, right there, backward there. Anyway, and just the time we need him, what? He's always near. Why? He's not still in the tomb. He rose from the dead. And so you see, we've got to understand that. So it was early on Sunday morning, first day of the week, that he, that he rose from the dead. And the women came there and realized that he was gone. And one of them was Mary Magdalene. I, leave, I love this. Mary Magdalene, former prostitute, out of whom the Lord had driven seven demons, a former demon-possessed woman of the streets is the first one that gets to come and discover that God had risen from the dead. You know what that tells me? I don't care where you've come from or what you've done. God has a place to use you. I don't care who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. When first century Jews, as I said, calculated time, you know, they calculated this. They considered any part of a day to be a full day. If you, were, if you were there just part of Friday, all day Saturday, and part of Sunday, they just consider that three days, three full days. And that's why he said three days and three nights. They just calculated it to be a full day, even if it was only a portion of a day. So Jesus was in the heart of the earth on Friday, shortly before 6 p.m., all day on Saturday, and on Sunday until almost 6 a.m. So he was there all of one day, which was Saturday, part of two days, Friday evening and Sunday morning. And so to the Jewish mind, that would have been three days. But the question that we must explore is, what did Jesus do during those three days that he was in the heart of the earth? He said, preacher, you're telling us he did ministry there. What was it? I'm glad you asked because I wanted to tell you. First of all, let's talk about his ministry in hell. I tell you about this all the time. He actually went to hell for us. I want to talk to you about his ministry in hell. 
during his post-burial and pre-resurrection ministry, we know that Jesus actually went to hell. We know that from Scripture. Peter referred to this fact during his sermon on the day of Pentecost. This is what he wrote. He quoted from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, where King David had written, and Peter quoted this in Acts chapter 2, verse 27. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Peter, in his Pentecost sermon, was quoting from King David, who had written there in Psalm 16 as if he were the Messiah. He was writing prophetically as if he were the Messiah, and he is crying out to God and, and being grateful to God because he says to God as if he were the Messiah, you will not leave my soul in hell. And then Peter quoted that in his sermon on the day of Pentecost to prove that God had raised Jesus from the dead. That Jesus not only went to hell, but what happened? God did not leave his soul in hell. He rose from the dead, came, you know, came out of hell, came back into his body, and rose from the dead. Peter, that's Peter's whole thesis in that sermon on the day of Pentecost, that section of the sermon. And what he does is he uses prophetic statement from King David to say that the Messiah, the Holy One, was not going to be left in hell. Well, let me ask you this. Why would you make the point that he wasn't going to be left in hell unless he went there? Do you get that? People want to argue with me sometimes about this. They say, oh, I can't believe that Jesus went to hell. Well, he did. That's just one evidence of it in the scripture right there. And then Peter explained that King David was talking about Jesus. This is what he said. It's in verses 30 and 31 of Acts chapter 2. After saying in verse 27, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Then he said this, therefore, being a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, that's of the fruit of David's body, a descendant of David, Jesus was a descendant of David, according to the flesh, that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, you see David was writing prophetically, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Isn't that amazing? His body didn't rot in the tomb. He, he left his body. He went into hell. He wasn't left in Hades or hell. He came back out of hell, back into his body, and he rose from the dead, and his body didn't decay. God put that body on ice, so to speak, so that no decay took place, no rigor mortis set in. None of that started happening while he was gone to hell. And then he came back and God used that to purchase eternal life for all of us. So you see, in order, in order to fully pay the penalty of mankind's sin, he had to experience in hell everything we deserve to experience because of our sin. The good news is that when he had suffered for our sins in hell, his soul was not left in Hades. Isn't that incredible? He wasn't left there. Hell couldn't hold him. Oh, the devil thought they could keep him there. But hell couldn't hold him. The gates of hell did not prevail. He came out of hell, back into his body, and he rose from the dead. Paul referred to this truth when he was writing to the believers at Ephesus regarding the spiritual gifts that Jesus has given to believers. This is what he wrote about grace gifts. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, now he's, he's kind of quoted from the Old Testament, and now he's going to say, now think about this. He says, now this. Now, if I'd have been saying that, I'd have said, you need to get this. But he said, now this, he ascended. So he's going back and he's capitalizing on those words. He ascended. Well, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? Get that? Before he could ascend, he first had to do what? descend 
which means, what does descend mean? Go down. Go down. Where did he go down to? The lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So you see, according to Paul, Jesus first descended into the lower parts of the earth, then he ascended far above all the heavens. So after his burial, Jesus first descended into hell, then returned to the tomb, rose from the dead, before he ultimately ascended into heaven. I mean, you got it right there. Jesus paid the penalty of mankind's sin by dying on a cross for us physically and then suffering the horrors of hell for us spiritually. Then he escaped from hell and he returned to the tomb. He rose from death because he holds the keys of death and Hades. John wrote that in the Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He, he's quoting Jesus as Jesus is saying, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And then he explains why he could do that. I hold the keys of death and Hades. So that's what Jesus did. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? That's significant ministry to the human race between his burial and before his resurrection. If he did not go to hell for us and experience in hell everything we deserve to experience, we could not escape hell now here's another thing here's something else he did he had a ministry in paradise and this will blow your mind i sometimes when i teach this stuff people have never heard this and they, their heads are spinning but he had this ministry in paradise you see in addition to his ministry in hell jesus also journeyed to and ministered in a place called paradise which is also in the lower parts of the earth. It was also in the heart of the earth. It was in paradise that he kept his promise to the thief on the cross. Remember what he promised the thief on the cross, the one that died next to him? You remember he was on the middle cross, a thief on each side? One of them became a believer hanging there on the cross. And this is what Jesus said to him in Luke 23, 43. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know when he said that? Friday before three o'clock because shortly after that he died and he said when today you will be with me in paradise that meant that Jesus left the tomb after he died and was buried and actually went into paradise while it was still Friday while it was still the preparation day because he said today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise was the place of comfort where the spirits and the souls of believers went at the point of physical death before the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to get that. When, when believers died before Jesus rose from the dead, they went to paradise. As far as we know, the last person to ever go to paradise in the heart of the earth was the thief that Jesus said today, we're going, buddy. You're going to be with me in paradise today. It was the place where Abraham went when he died. It was the place where Lazarus went when he died. It was the place, now get this, it was the place that was in the same vicinity as hell. Same vicinity as hell. And here's how we know that. It's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 26. Look at this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. So wherever Abraham was, that is where Lazarus went when he died. Same place that the thief on the cross went the day he and Jesus died. Paradise. So the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And where did he go? <laughs> in Hades, and we call that hell. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away. Now get that. Abraham and Lazarus are in paradise. They're in a place of comfort. They're in a good place. 
but it is in the same neighborhood as hell. Because this rich man who was in Hades, he saw Abraham and Lazarus by his side. He looked up and saw that. There was a separation between the two places. But they were close enough that the rich man could see Abraham and Lazarus over there having all the good things he had missed out on. Think about hell's going to be bad, right? Because it's a place of fire and torment and, you know, all of that. I see something on the Facebook every once in a while that says we need preachers that preach, and then it gives a list of things, and one of them is that hell is hot. <laughs> okay? And we get these descriptions of hell throughout the scriptures. But think how the emotional torment that must have been there because you can, at that time you could see from hell over into paradise and see how good those folks had it and realize how bad you were having it. Had to be some real turmoil going on there. So in Hades... Where he was in torment, this rich man looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham. Now get this. They were in earshot of one another. Because he calls to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. And Abraham could hear him. They were close enough that Abraham could hear the conversation. Because Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. There's a contrast, isn't it? One's a place of comfort, one's a place of agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm, a great space, a great expanse has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us what's he saying you're there and you're stuck there we're here and we're stuck here we can't leave and go over there and you can't leave and come over here they were evidently in the same neighborhood both of them in the heart of the earth in the lower regions of the earth so prior to the resurrection of jesus the souls the spirits of believers who died were incarcerated in a place called paradise so jesus went there and preached to them he wouldn't preach to them Peter wrote about that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20. He wrote, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. There's his resurrection. Made alive by the Spirit, and it's by the same Spirit, by whom also, look at what he did. He went and preached to the spirits in prison. Spirits who were incarcerated, both in hell and in paradise, Jesus went and preached to them. And what about some of these people, especially the people in paradise? I think that's the ones he's talking about here. He says some of these people were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. You know what that says to me? It says that it appears that there were some believers in addition to Noah and his family when the flood came. However, they were disobedient to God's demand to get on the ark. And as a result, they drowned in the flood and they wound up in paradise. And Jesus went there and preached to folks like that. People who were believers before the resurrection of Jesus, they died, they wound up in paradise. Jesus goes into paradise and he preaches to them. And when he gets there, his message is an announcement that these believers who died prior to Jesus' resurrection, an announcement to them that he had purchased their freedom, that he was going to move them out of paradise. They weren't going to be incarcerated in the heart of the earth in paradise anymore, but he was going to move them to a new place right in the presence of God. He had purchased their freedom when he died physically on the cross and he died spiritually when he went to hell for them. And then Jesus led those who were captive spirits in paradise in the heart of the earth to a new place of bliss above in the very presence of God. This transfer of paradise from below to above is what Paul was describing there in Ephesians chapter 4 when he said, 
that when he ascended on high, that's when Jesus went back up to heaven, who did he take with him? He took some people with him because it says he led captivity captive. Those who were in captivity in paradise in the heart of the earth have been led out of that place of captivity up to where Jesus was going, which is right into the presence of his Father in heaven. Do you get that? So prior to the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, people who died as believers went into the heart of the earth into paradise. People who died as unbelievers went into the heart of the earth to hell. The people in hell are still there. People are still going there today when they die without Jesus. But the people in paradise were moved out of that place of captivity in paradise and moved up to where heaven is today. So today when you die, after the resurrection of Jesus, what happens to us when we die? We go immediately into the presence of God because according to the book of Hebrews, Jesus already went there ahead of us, presented his blood before the Father, tore open the curtain, and made a new and living way for us to go right into the presence of God when we die. You get that? Let me clear up something. This is not in your notes. No extra charge for this. I'm just going to throw it in. This is a freebie, okay? When you die, when a believer dies, your body is the only part of you that goes into the grave. Your spirit is already gone. That's why your body is dead. And your spirit immediately goes into the presence of the Lord in heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul said that for us to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. You get that? So don't go out to the cemetery and talk to the grave it's okay to go out there and honor the memory of your loved one, but don't go out there and talk to the grave. That person is not there. Do you get that? That person is not there. And so we need, to, we need to understand that. He led captivity captive, and then he gave gifts. He gave these grace gifts to men. So here's the conclusion. Because Jesus went into the heart of the earth and defeated Satan on his own turf, God offers the benefits of that victory to every authentic believer. That's why Paul wrote this. Thanks be to God who does what? Gives us the victory. Why can Jesus just hand us the victory? He defeated Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. The devil is a punk. Jesus has already won. We need to understand that. And so thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus has already won the victory and he gives it to every one of us who is an authentic believer in his son. You get that? Isn't that incredible? That is significant ministry that happened between the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Without that, we could not have hope. We could not have eternal life. And the church just doesn't say near enough about that.